With 35 defenders in the game, I guarantee you you're making a lot of mistakes with each operator, which is why in today's video I'll be giving you one mistake for every operator in Siege. The first of which being smoke. Now the mistake that I see smoke players making is they peek into their own smokes. So let's say I throw a smoke grenade here. What I don't want to do is sit and just hold the smoke. No one's going to push the smoke because you just threw it down, so they're going to back up, right? So instead, try to hold a different angle, so that as smoke, you're effectively holding two different places at one time. My next operator is Mute. Now, as Mute, the mistake that I see a lot of players making is they put their Mute Jammers way too far away from where they're playing. With Deimos, Jackal, Dokebi, and Lion all being in the game, having a Mute Jammer next to you is crucial to counter most of these operators, especially in the current meta. So, pick up that Mute Jammer that's far away from you, and instead, put a Mute Jammer that's close to where you're playing, maybe like right here. Now this Mute Jammer will still stop drones who are trying to drone inside of kids, but it also makes it to where if you're trying to actually play on this pixel right here, you can't get Dokebi called, you can move in a Lion Scan, you can't get tracked by Deimos, and many other more things. My next operator is Castle. Now, for Castle, what you want to do is instead of just barricading random doors into sight like this if you're playing inside of Gym, what you want to do is barricade things that don't make it hard for your roamers to come back into sight. Like, let's say, this sight window instead. This doesn't interrupt your roamers, but it still takes away a key angle that attackers can use, and if they want to get the key angle back, they have to waste a lot of time or utility to destroy your castle barricade. This is why, whenever people are defending Jim and they're sitting in cash with Castle, instead of castling the doorway just like this, people have adapted instead to just reinforcing this wall, and reinforcing these two cash walls here, and then castling this window instead. Having these two walls reinforced as well as that wall and this castled off will allow you to actually play inside of CC and utilize this window to get peeks onto anybody on the highway whenever you want to, instead of bottlenecking you into only playing inside of cash and giving them this wall for absolutely free. So make sure that you're extending with castle instead of just turtling on wherever you're playing that's default. Moving on to his FBI counterpart, let's talk about Pulse. The mistake I see with Pulse is people getting on their Pulse Scanner and just waiting and then throwing their Nitro Cell about and then exploding it. You don't want to do this. Instead, you want to pre-place the Nitro and then get on your Pulse Scanner once you see somebody on your Nitro, then blow it up. Now you might be wondering, well what if they don't push where your Nitro Cell is? Well then you can literally just shoot the soft portion of the floor around your Nitro Cell and then your Nitro Cell falls down and you can pick it up. And you don't give them a vert angle either because you only shot out one layer of wood. So pre-placing it is going to be a lot faster and more reliable whenever you're trying to go for a C4 kill like this common one right here. Next is Doc. Now as Doc, the mistake I see is people not playing on site. You wanna stay on site because the majority of your team is on site or at least they have to rotate back to site at some point. And if you're being a good doc and actually healing your teammates, you need to be as close to them as possible, which is why you typically just need to be on site. He also has an ACOG, which is great for holding angles, which you primarily do on the site. So make sure you're just anchoring instead of roaming his doc. Moving on to his French counterpart, we have Rook. Now the stick I see with Rook players is you're not placing down your armor early enough in the round. The later you place it, the more that your teammates have to go out of their way to do whatever they're doing to come back to site to get your Rook armor, which just wastes a lot of their time. It's very annoying, so make sure that the first thing you do when you spawn in as Rook is put your armor down. The most common mistake that I see with Capcan is people put their traps on the wrong side of the door when playing Capcan. You should never put a Capcan trap that's easily able to be seen by any attackers. For example, these Capcan traps are super easy to see because attackers come on this doorway, so if they want to shoot the Capcan traps, they easily can. But if you were to put it on this side of the doorway, just like this, now, unless they're actually actively looking for your Capcan trap, they're never going to see that. Especially if you barricade the door before you put the Capcan traps down and then unbarricade it, now this little lip of X barricade covers up your Capcan trap even more, so whenever they try to clear it and they don't really see it because of the barricade, you'll easily get a free kill, or at least some free damage. Moving on to his Russian counterpart, let's talk about Tachanka. Now the mistake that I see Tachanka players making is not playing behind their shield enough. At Tachanka, when he had a turret, everyone was behind their shield, but whenever he got fire in a launcher, people stopped doing this for whatever reason. This shield allows you to play with your utility a lot safer. One of the drawbacks of Tachanka is that you have this clunky launcher that takes a lot of seconds to pull out and put away. But if you're behind a shield and you use it from cover, just like this, you never even have to expose yourself in the first place, which takes the worst part about Tachanka 
completely away and makes him a lot more viable. The next operator is Jaeger. Now the mistake that I see Jaeger players making is whenever they're placing their ADSs, they place their ADSs way too close to them instead of placing it way too close to the enemies. This is the exact opposite tip of what I'm giving you with Mute. The reason that you want to put Jaeger ADSs close to the enemies in stark contrast of Mute Jammers is because if they're throwing utility from a doorway and your ADS only covers you, the ADS isn't going to cover all angles that it possibly could be. So let's say an attacker is throwing a grenade over to this corner, or the headles here, or the door here. Well, your ADS that's behind the shelf meant to cover you on this doorway holding the angle isn't going to cover any of those previous angles that I just mentioned. But if you put the Jaeger ADS right next to the doorway, it will cover every single possible place that a grenade will get thrown to and from, which is why you need to start putting your aces close to the enemies and not close to you. Moving on to his German counterpart, let's talk about Bandit. Now the mistake that I see Bandit players making is they place their Bandit charges in the wrong spot on the wall. Let's say you're trying to Bandit trick. It makes more sense to put your Bandit charges on the outside of the wall whenever you're tricking instead of on the inside of the double wall like this Bandit battery. This is because if you're trying to Bandit trick and one of your Bandit batteries goes down, it's a lot easier for you to just look at the side of the wall and place your Bandit battery down to actually, you know, like replace this one than it would be to go around a bandit battery and then put it on this side of the wall. You waste a few key milliseconds doing that. Instead, you want to save a few key milliseconds by just sitting in the middle, having your two bandits on the outside, which is harder for them to EMP by the way, and then just quickly placing it down. Just turning somewhere and placing it, instead of having to go around something, walk, turn, and then place. Those extra few milliseconds that you're saving by doing this is an extra few milliseconds that can be the difference between this wall getting opened and this wall staying closed. The next operator is Frost. Now the mistake that I see Frost players making is whenever they put a Frost mat down under a window, they put the Frost mat down way too close to whatever wall they're putting it down on. You actually want to be putting your Frost mat a little bit farther back, because when they repel in, sometimes they can actually skip over the Frost mat, especially if they're vaulting over something too, just like this. So this doesn't just go for windows. You want to be putting your frost mats a tiny bit actually backwards instead of flush with the wall. That way there's no chance at all that they miss your frost mat. Now, you might be saying that this is more exposed to people who were repelled on the window. This is true, but if you were worried about that in the first place, you wouldn't put a frost mat under a window. The next operator is Valkyrie. Now the mistake that I see players making is they put Valkyrie cameras in just random corners because they think that putting Valkyrie cameras in corners is just how you play Valkyrie. This isn't true. I found a lot that putting Valkyrie cameras in brighter places instead of darker ones actually hides the camera a lot better, because if you didn't have any previous knowledge that this Valkyrie camera was here before, your mind wouldn't immediately think that that's a Valkyrie camera. Your mind, considering all of the light around it, would assume that that is the light bulb. And trust me, this Valkyrie camera has never been found in not one of my ranked games because of this simple trick, and this works on literally any other light bulb in the game. And as you can see when you get on it, it still provides a lot of information, so it's not like it lacks in that department either. Putting Valkyrie cameras in light surfaces actually drowns them out a lot more than putting them in dark ones, because once you get on the camera, the light on it is going to appear anyways and completely take away the illusion that it was dark in the first place. My next operator is Caviera. Now the mistake that I see Caviera players making is they commit to flanks way too much. So let's say that they're pushing the top floor to get vert on open area. As Caviera, you're flanking top square. Now as Caviera, if you're about to flank just like this and you see people here but they drone you out first, instead of shooting that drone and continuing to push up, you should shoot that drone and then immediately leave. Now, you don't do this on most other roamers, but you want to do it specifically on Caviera because if you do this, it forces them to roam clear you. Well, isn't that like that with every other operator? No. This is because the threat of an interrogation is so great in attackers' minds that they will do anything in their power to not get flanked again, and if you leave the flank, they're gonna spend a lot more time watching every flank and trying to clear you out than they would with any other operator because Cav may be seen as a bad roamer, but in a really, really good player's hands, she could be the most threatening operator in the game. The next operator is Echo. The mistake I see Echo players making is they'll randomly just throw cameras down in the middle of the round. You never want to do this. Instead, you need to find strategic places to actually throw your Echo cameras to get the most amount of value. Just like that. An Echo camera like this can see all of main lobby, and it's very, very hidden in the process. Making it to where you still get as much information as, let's say, a Valkyrie camera would, 
but you also get a new element of surprise that you never thought would be possible with echo cameras. The next operator is Mira. The mistake I see Mira players making is they peek off of their mirrors way too much. People will sit and try to bait your mirrors and bait your swing, but if you just look at people through the mirrors, you'll waste a lot of time because they won't know really what to do if they didn't bring an operator to counter you. If you only really peek when they're going for a plant, you can easily get the most amount of power with mirror you've ever gotten just because you're not over peeking like most people do. My next operator is Legion. Now the mistake that I see Legion players making is they don't know the order at which they should be placing their Legion mines. As Legion, if you're playing top floor Oregon like me right now, should you place Legion mines, let's say, close to you first? Or should you place Legion mines that you're not really going to be playing off of that are kind of further away from you like this first? Well, the answer is actually the latter. You want to be placing Legion mines the farthest away from you first in the prep phase. Why do you want to do this? Well, Legion has something called a rechargeable ability. This means that his ability recharges over time and you get more and more of his ability the longer you are alive. Keywords, the longer that you are alive. Because you want to be alive the longest, the role that stays alive the longest is an anchor, which means you need to be anchoring on site as Legion. If you're anchoring on site, you don't really have time mid-round to go across the map to place a lesion mine far away from you just to get that extra piece of information if they're going for a backsite push. No, instead, you want to put these lesion mines down first in the prep phase, because as you're anchoring and enemies are pushing you and they're getting closer and closer to site, the lesion mines that are going to matter later and later in the round are the ones to site, due to the fact that that's just where attackers are going to be pushing. So, making sure that you place lesion mines the farthest away from you down first, so that later in the round you can put lesion mines that are actually necessary in the proper places that they're pushing is crucial because if you have legion mines across the map for information but they're doing an entire white stairs take and no one is trophy you don't want to waste your last few legion mines putting some on main you want to put them all stacked on the white door right here to get the most amount of value out of them while still having a little bit of legion mines scattered across the map in case they try to rotate my next operator is ella now the mistake that i see ella players making is not pocketing an Ella mine in their inventory. You should start using Ella mine less like a trap operator and more like Zofia. As you can see by the radius whenever I put this Ella mine down, Ella mines arm themselves fairly quickly. Just like that, it's activated. And that takes pretty much no time at all. So if I'm playing Ella and I'm playing inside of Armory and there's a person close on the left in dirt, what I can do is throw an Ella mine down just like this right behind him on the door. Now he's gonna turn around and shoot that, but if he does, I can kill him. If he doesn't do that, then he'll be stunned, and I can kill him. So either way, it's kind of a win-win scenario for me, so pocketing Ella mines can be really useful, especially because Ella only has three of these mines, meaning that if you put down three mines in three different locations, chances are they're only going to push one, maybe two of those locations, meaning some of your Ella mines went to waste anyways. So making sure that you pocket a few Ella mines, maybe not to throw at people, but at least to place down later when you know where they're pushing from, is a great way to utilize Ella effectively and efficiently. My next operator is Vigil. Now, as Vigil, the mistake that I see players making is whenever they activate their Vigil scan, as you can see right here, they move around or they'll sprint around. You never want to do this. The second you activate your scanner, just like this, you want to sit still and not move a muscle. This is due to the fact that the more you move, the greater the white lines will appear. As you can see when I'm still, look at the white lines on my screen. Now when I start moving around erratically, they get a little bit more excited and bigger, but the second I slow down, so do the white lines. And it's not as exaggerated on defense as much as it really is on attack. So if it looked super different on defense, it's going to look way worse whenever you're droning a vigil on attack. So if you're droning on attack and you see a vigil with his ability active and you see huge white lines, you know the vigil's in the room. But if the vigil's sitting still, not moving, not making a sound, not only can you not hear if he's in the room, but the white lines appear so small that your brain immediately thinks, oh, he's maybe in a room over or two rooms over, or maybe he's on a different floor. You'll never assume that he's two feet away from you, which is exactly why you never want to move the second you activate your vigil scanner. Now, the next operator is Maestro. Now, the mistake that I see Maestro players making is they'll put cameras in way too obvious positions. Let's say that this wall right here is open because they breached it open, right? If they breach this wall open and you're trying to deny a plant with a Maestro camera, let's say like right here, for example, 
they're easily just gonna have a guy on this wall ADSing your maestro camera the entire time while his teammate plants right here so that you can't shoot him with your maestro camera. However, if you were to place a maestro camera like right here, they can't do that. This guy on the plant is all alone. He can either make a decision to plant or to get shot by your maestro camera. And with the cooldown reduction buffs, it makes it to where he can actually fully down you when you're on full HP with one single mag of maestro zap bullets. The next operator is Alibi, and the mistake that I see Alibi players making is doing what I just did, putting Alibi clones in the open. If someone's on this window, they can easily just shoot the feet of that Alibi clone. So make sure that if you're putting an Alibi clone anywhere, the feet of that Alibi clone are covered. A great example would be this Alibi clone right here. People on this window won't be able to kill this Alibi clone because its feet where, you know, the projector is actually located, it's completely hidden. You might be thinking, this is really obvious, but I'm in champion, and I see my own teammates making this dumb mistake. The next operator is Clash. Now, the mistake that I see Clash players making is they put themselves in positions that they can easily get flanked from. If I'm a Clash player, and what I'm deciding is my job is to hold the 45 hall, or the double door right here, this is terrible. Because I can get flanked from anybody on the top of blue stairs, the bottom of blue stairs, anybody coming in through the mud door, anybody coming in through the hallway if I'm holding this door. It's just not a good idea. So as Clash, instead play in a position where you can't get flanked. Let's say I play on this window. The only place they could possibly flank me from is the hatch or from this door. But if I have teammates that are playing in library as they should, this won't be a problem. My next operator is Cade. The mistake I see Cade players making is they'll throw Cade Claws at the top of the middle of the wall, just like this. Never do this. 9 times out of 10, most team compositions will bring EMP grenades, and if they know you're playing Cade, that is the first place they will EMP grenade because it's so common. Instead, put an EMP grenade in the exact middle of one of the reinforcements. This Cade Claw will still electrify both walls, but because of the fact that it's in the middle of the reinforcement, when they try to inevitably EMP the top middle and then the bottom middle of the wall to find your Cade Claw, this Cade Claw right here will not get EMP'd. The next operator is Mozzie. Now the mistake that I see Mozzie players making is they'll put their pest down on site in the prep phase. Never do this. As Mozzie in the prep phase, you should be shooting drones and eliminating as much information as possible. This is because naturally Mozzie is a roamer, so using your pests to make sure they can't clear you on the roam, or at least drone you on the roam for that matter, is going to be crucial whenever you're on the roam. So not only are you denying information by shooting drones in the prep phase, but you're also denying information by making it to where they can't drone you, which makes you able to waste a lot more time on the roam, which is your job in the first place. My next operator is Warden. The mistake that I see Warden players making is not preemptively activating your glasses. A lot of people, when playing Warden, will just activate their glasses only after a flash has been thrown at them, or only after a smoke has gone down. As Warden, your cooldown just got a buff a few seasons ago, so you can actually keep these glasses active for a long amount of time. And if you don't want to waste the entire cooldown, you can take it off. Let it recharge, activate it. Once it gets to like halfway, take it off. Then activate it. Then reactivate it again. This will make it to where the amount of time you have your Warden goggles on is a lot more, which increases the chances of your goggles actually being on in the first place whenever they're needed to be on. And it also makes it to where they won't hear your goggles get on after they bait you getting your goggles on whenever they flash you, because they know you're playing Warden, which will get them a free kill, because they're baiting you, right? But if your goggles were already on, then they won't be baiting you. You'll be baiting them, and then you can get a free kill. So just making sure that you're actually using the ability more and more and more and keeping it active the entire time, or as long as you viably can, is a great way to increase the amount of efficiency you're getting out of Warden. My next operator is Goyo. The mistake that I see Goyo players making is putting their Goyo canisters on the wrong side of whatever door they're putting it on. The side of which you're putting the Goyo canister on is heavily determined by how you're holding the angle. So let's say that I'm playing blue stairs, but I want to activate the Goyo canister for dirt. Having the Goyo canister on the left side of the doorway right here would be a terrible idea then. Because if I'm playing in blue, I have to completely peek the entire door where I know an enemy is to then shoot the Goyo canister. But if it was on the right side, all I have to do is peek the Goyo canister and not expose myself to danger and still have the same amount of utility on the board. The next operator is Wamai. Now the mistake that I see Wamai players making is they put their Wamai discs way too close to each other. You don't want to do this because if a frag grenade gets caught in the Wamai disc, the frag grenade will explode and kill the other one my disc. So you want to make sure that you're putting them farther apart, especially because the range on these bad boys is actually huge. 
My next operator is Oryx. Now, as Oryx, the mistake that I see the most people making is they'll Oryx dash just like I did to make rotates in sight. This might seem really quick and efficient, and it's the whole ability of the operator, so why would you not do it? Well, don't do it, because you have a bailiff that can do everything I just did, but in maybe like two thirds of the time. It's really not that much slower compared to doing this, and that amount of HP can be the difference between you dying to someone and living off of 5 HP. So just don't do it unless you got a Thunderbird on the table. My next operator is Malusi. The mistake that I see Malusi players making is they're not putting their traps in the right places. For example, if I put a trap, let's say right here for the door, right there, this might seem like a good idea, because it only gets activated the second they walk in the door. But that's just the thing. Once they walk in the door, all they have to do is look down, shoot it, and now it's not a thing. Instead, put the Malusi Banshee right next to the door, just like this. Now, if they want to walk in and shoot the Malusi Banshee, they have to turn all the way around, which exposes their back to 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6 different angles, and that's just for this example alone. On other examples, you could be exposing yourself to way more which makes it to where putting Malusi Banshees on these sides of doorways is a lot more favorable for your gadget. The next operator is a Rooney. Now the mistake that I see people making is they'll put a Rooney Gates on rotates like this. This might seem like a good idea because then it acts like a makeshift reinforcement to where attackers have to actually push through this if you want to leave the rotate and not have them come through, but it's not a good idea. The reason for this being is because when you get close to an Aruni Gate, it deactivates and makes a loud sound when you do. So anytime that you go through this rotate, whenever you're contesting construction, they'll know. And once they hear the Aruni Gate get deactivated, they're just going to run in or swing you and kill you. So you never, ever want to put Aruni Gates on rotates with a few rare exceptions. The next operator is Thunderbird. Now the mistake that I see Thunderbird players making is you're putting your healing stations way too close to where you're playing. Now this might seem like a good idea, right? So you can constantly get heals, but it's not and I'll explain why. If you're a defender that has like pretty high health but you're missing a little bit of HP, a Thunderbird will still heal you and it'll even give you overheal, but chances are you have a teammate who's way less HP than you that can use this healing a lot more than you. But if your healing station is right next to where you're running around when you're trying to rotate, you're gonna steal that heal from him. So instead, put Thunderbird stations in places where it's still close to you, but it's far away enough to where you actually have to run and go get it. So you're always purposeful whenever you're getting healed and you're not accidentally taking it from teammates who need the healing more than you. A Thunderbird like that is a great example. Whenever you're passing and rotating right here, you're not accidentally gonna try to rotate through this hole and then go, oh, I went over here, got a heal on accident, and then go through the rotate. Right? Like, that's just not gonna happen. But if you have a Thunderbird, like, right next to this door, sure, you might get healed when you pass through the door on accident, but that's not good if your teammates are lower health. So make sure, I mean, even a position like this, like this corner, right? No one's gonna accidentally just go in this corner. If they're going to a rotate, chances are they're hugging this bomb because they don't want to get swung from white stairs, right? So you're not gonna hit that, but it's still so close to you that if it's safe and you need healing, you can just go over here, get it, come back. It's super easy. So make sure you're thinking about that when you're playing Thunderbird. The next operator is Thorn. Now, instead of putting Thorn traps in places where they could, uh, like, you know, easily just walk in, activate it, and walk out, you want to put Thorn traps in places where they can't just easily walk out or else they'll die. A great example of this is windows. If they're going to hop into a window, chances are they're probably going to have to commit. Maybe because they've droned it or they know no one's here. Either way, if someone hops through a window, they usually have to commit because if they want to hop back out of the window, it locks them in an animation, makes a lot of noise, and takes a lot of time. So it's either A, they hop in and they stick it and have to take a gunfight with you, but they die to a thorn trap, or they hop out and you shoot them from the bottom of the staircase. Either way, it's a win-win for you and a lose-lose for them. So make sure that you put thorn traps in places, not even just windows, but anywhere that's hard for them to escape so they can't just bait out the activation of your thorn traps. The next operator is Azami. Now with the Azami rework, people can easily just shoot your Azami barricades because they have 999 health. As you can see, I'm just shooting it down perfectly fine, and eventually it's just going to break. Because of this, the way that you play a zombie needs to change. You never want to throw a zombie barricades at the top of doors. Now, this previously actually was a pretty good idea because it forced them to melee it and expose themselves or crouch and expose themselves even more. But now that they can just, you know, shoot it, it doesn't really make sense to do that as much. So instead, you only want to be using a zombie barricades to create deployable shields for yourself. 
The next operator is Fenrir. Now, the mistake that I see Fenrir players making is whenever they have a mine activated and they hear the mine get activated and they swing, they end up dying because it actually takes a few seconds for the attackers to get blind after the Fenrir device hits them. So, make sure whenever the Fenrir device activates and blinds them, you wait about a second, maybe even a second and a half, and then you swing them when they're fully blind. That way you get the best effect out of Fenrir. Also, having a suppressor on his gun so they can't actually see the bullet tracers when you're shooting them will make him even more deadly. The final defender on this list is going to be Turborow. Now the mistake that I see Turborow players making is they put their Turborow canisters on a wall whenever they're trying to freeze it way too close to the center. Now Turborow is a lot like Cade, where even if the simple radius of the frost touches a little bit of the reinforcement, the entire reinforcement will be frozen. As you can see, if I put my, you know, my, my Turborow canister right, like, let's say, up here, both and all of this wall will be frozen. So it doesn't matter exactly where you are, which means you can give your Cade a little bit of room to put a Cade Claw, let's say, at the bottom of this wooden wall right here, so that the second this deactivates like it just did, it'll be electrified again, which can make Cade Turborow tricking a hell of a lot more effective. But that's pretty much it for this video. My name's Alka, sub the channel down below, check out this next video, and I hope I'll see you there. Later.